Number 16. Finally, those who have not yet received the gospel are related to the people of God in various ways. The church, that means. Those who have not yet received the gospel. It would have been nice if they had added potentially. They might convert and then they are in the church. So, potentially they are related to the church. Potentially they are in the church. Actually they are not. There is first that people to which the covenants and promises were made and from which Christ was born according to the flesh. In view of the divine choice, they are people of most dear for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts of God and without re repentance. The Jews, of course. Now, are the Jews related to the Catholic Church? I'm talking about the Jewish faith. I'm not talking about the individual Jew. It's the Jewish faith, whatever they call it, the Mosaic faith, all the different, the Hasidim and whatever. Are they related to the Church? No, they're not. St. Paul says quite clearly, the Jews rejecting Christ do not even see the truth of the Old Testament, but through a veil or a curtain. Do the Jews pray to the same God we do? No. Is the God of the Old Testament the same God of the New Testament? Yes. But as they do not accept the God of the New Testament, they also reject the one of the Old Testament because they are identical. You see? Those people who contradict me on this point, I've got them in a beautiful trap. <laughs> Either you say the Jews do not pray to the same God, or the God of the Old Testament is not the same as the New Testament. I'll leave the choice with you. St. Paul is very clear on that. The Jews have rejected God when they crucified Christ. All Jews? No, the Jews. Not the individual. I don't know about the individual. It is heresy and it is blasphemy. And the same Roman Gentium 16 tells me that the Jews and I pray to the same God. The Jews explicitly reject the Incarnation. The Jews explicitly rejected the idea of the Blessed Trinity, and they call it names, believe me, in their books. And how? Not even I would quote that. And now Vatican II tells me we are all praying to the same God. Do you realize that a certain German author, Gotthold Elf Ephraim Lessing, in the 18th century, wrote a, a, a play called The Ring Parable, the, Paral the Parable of the Ring in which he has a representative of the Catholic Church, a representative of uh, the Muslims, and a representative of the Jewish faith, agreeing with each other that everything is the same anyway, because we pray to the same God. God called Ephraim Lessing was a practicing and open Freemason. And here we have Vatican II, a so-called ecumenical council, repeating what God called Ephraim Lessing, the admittedly open Freemason said in his play. The idea, the concept, that the Muslims and the Jews pray into the same God as we do, which our present Paul repeats over and over again. This concept is heresy, it implies a lot of other heresies, and it is blasphemy. And anybody who tells me that we can interpret this in a Catholic way is to say the least a little bit nuts.
There was an appendix, chapter 8, on Our Lady. Many council fathers wanted the council to speak in a separate document on Our Lady. Cardinal Koenig of Vienna said, no, there's need, no need for it. And believe it or not, by the time the council was finished, I think some people would agree with me when they say, thank God, the council at least didn't say much about Our Lady. Nothing good would have come out of it anyway. At the end of this document, which is ending my conference today, at the end of this document, there's an explanatory, explanatory note. Announcement made by the Secretary General of the Council at the 123rd General Congregation, November 16, 1964. A query has been made as to what is the theological qualification. I explained. Remember when I said, when I talked about the positions of, uh, uh, the theological positions, when I said something is of divine faith, defined faith, close to the faith, sententia certa, a reasonable sure, we're sure about it, or it's just probable. This is what is mean, what's meant here, theological qualifications. That means, is this council dogmatic or not? A query has been made as to what is the theological qualification to be attached to the teaching put forward in the scheme the church on which a vote is to be taken. The doctrinal commission has replied to this query in appraising the Modi, the Modi, I mean the different ways of, uh, proposed to the third chapter of the schema, the church, that means human gentleman. As is self-evident, the conciliar text is to be interpreted in accordance with the general rules which are known to all. I mean face value. So please uh, don't try to tell me that all this can find can really find a Catholic interpretation. On face value, it doesn't, and that's good enough for me. On this occasion, the doctrinal commission referred to its declaration of March 6, 1964, which we reproduced here. I quote, Taking into account conciliar practice and the pastoral purpose of this present council, the sacred synod defined as binding on the church only those matters of faith and morals which it has expressly put forward as such. Whatever else is proposed as the teaching of the supreme magisterium of the church is to be acknowledged and accept, accepted by each and every member of the faithful according to the mind of the council, which is clear from the subject matter and formulation following the norms of theological interpretation. That means the council is at most ordinary magisterium, not extraordinary magisterium. I read Pope Pius XII on ordinary magisterium to you, and I explained with this in a context with what uh, uh, Pope uh, Innocent III and many other popes and saints and doctors of the church, I forgot to mention St. Robert Bellarmine, say, the council does not have the authority of ordinary teaching because in parts of its documents, it contradicts directly, you've seen a few of the heresies, the ones I'm going to tell, to talk about uh, in the next session will be even be worse. Because the Council contradicts ordinary and extraordinary magisterium in the past, the Council cannot claim the authority of ordinary magisterium. Archbishop Lefebvre asked Cardinal Terry Cletolici, the Secretary of the Council, on the theological qualification, in addition to this declaration. And Cardinal Felici said, well, of course, as far as those, uh, those things are concerned that the council quoted from former councils anyway, they have to be upheld. Of course. But as far as the new things are concerned, they have to be taken with care. Now, taken with care means you look at how the church interpreted things in the past and how the church took position to document in the past. At the, in the old days, there was an index, a list of forbidden books. There was a proper congregation in the Roman Curia, congregation of the index, just on that topic. Just, uh, there was a few pious and learned priests who would read through endless boring and stupid books in order to find out if they're acceptable to a Catholic or not. Now, just to show you how the church thought about that once upon a time, the wonderful novel by Alexandre Dumas, The Three Musketeers, was put on the index because Alexandre Dumas made fun of the cardinals of the Holy Roman Church. Cardinal Armand Jean, 
Richelieu, Armand Jean Duplessis de Richelieu, Cardinal and Archbishop of Paris, Grand Admiral of the King, Louis XIII, was a criminal. He signed a contract with the Turks against the Catholic Empire of Austria. He was a criminal. He bribed Protestant, uh, uh, he, he bribed Catholic, uh, he, he bribed, excuse me, he bribed princes and counts in Germany in order to become Protestants, therefore binding their local territory to the Protestant religion and therefore destroy the power of Austria against France. Colonel Richelieu was a politician of the worst kind. He was the prince not his age. <laughs> and yet, because he was a cardinal of the Holy Roman Church, the church did not approve of a lay author making fun of him in a book. If you say that's exaggerated, I agree. I've read The Three Musketeers four times over. And I, read, and I saw practically all the movies based on the book. And I love the book. And Cardinal Richelieu was a criminal. But anyway, the church found it scandalous just because they made fun of the cardinal, of a cardinal of the Holy Roman Church. Now you can imagine how the Congregation of the Index treated a book that contained heresy. Back home, I have a very good translation of the Bible into German, written by uh, Van S. V A N E W -S, S. Van S. The Van S. Bible is on the Index because it contains a few minor errors. It's been put on the Index, even though it's the Bible. It's been put on the Index because of a few minor errors. Taking educated guess what the congregation of the index would have done with this book. <laughs> and this is why, and be very careful about the distinction I'm about to make, this is why I reject Vatican II. Non in omnibus, set in toto. Non in omnibus, set in toto. I reject Vatican II as a whole, not in each line. That would be heretical because they occasionally the Vatican II quotes the Council of Trent and Nicaea and whatever. I quote, uh, excuse me, they quote uh, old councils, and as far as they do that, they proclaim the doctrine of the Church. But as far as the new things are concerned, as Cardinal Felice said, they have to be taken with care. Therefore, I solemnly reject this book. I reject Vatican II in its entirety, not in every single line, as such. I reject this book as because it contains heresy, not because everything in it is heresy. The, the, the translation of the Bible made by Martin Luther is not entirely wrong, but it has always been rejected by the church because of a few mistakes deliberately or erroneously inserted. The church rejects a book the moment the church finds one single grave error in the book. If the church has always done that, then I have to do so. I've just shown you a few errors. Let's just call them errors. Some people get upset when I pronounce the judgment on what is heresy, what is not heresy. I couldn't tell it what they say, but anyway, uh, at least some of the things in this council are erroneous. Therefore, I reject it. And you have to if you want to stay Catholic. Thank you. Sperando previne, sa giovando prosegue, cunto nostra oratio da paratio, te sem principio, te te cepta finiato, e per questum dominum nostrum, amen, sancte pie, decime ora pro nobis. Yesterday I gave an introduction to the new liturgy, today I'm going to talk about Vatican II. That's where it all started. Well, it started in the last century, as you will hear, you will hear on the other tapes, but uh, Vatican II is the doctrinal basis of a new church. And uh, there is one general remark that I have to make about the entire Vatican Council. First of all, I personally, I underline, I personally do not believe, because I say personally, because there's no papal pronouncement on it yet. I personally do not believe that Vatican II was an ecumenical council. For the simple reason that Vatican II had no intention of defining dogma. I have to remind you that all of the ecumenical councils in history, without a single exception, 
<coughs> had the intention of defining dogma, and all of them, with one exception, did. The Council of Lyon never defined dogma because they just never got around to do it, but they wanted to. Third, there was never an ecumenical council called in unless there was a crisis of faith, like the Council of Trent was called in after the uh, Lutheran reformers messed up the church in the northern countries. Vatican II was called in for no other reason but Pope John's inspiration. So that's no reason to call in an ecumenical council. Maybe I'm wrong with what I say in the sense that uh, it is the, uh, the council fathers and the pope who formally declare something to be an ecumenical council, but in that case it is certainly at least to say the least, a very exceptional ecumenical council. It is also exceptional in another regard. It is the first council ever to pronounce heresy. Vatican II, as a whole, is unacceptable to a Catholic. And after the talk, you will see why. Now, let's have... We, I, time does not permit me to go through all the details of Vatican II, so I will point out the most important errors and heresies. First of all, I have to do away with a, a mistake of interpretation. The first document of Vatican II called Sacro Sanctum Concilium is the Constitution on the Liturgy. Some people seem to believe that the new rite of mass that Paul VI issued in 1969 is against the will of the Council. It is not. The document, the first document of the Council, Sacrosanctum Concilium, is formulated in a way that you can do with it whatever you want. The very same, in the very same document you find number 22.2, giving to faculty, to the bishops' conferences, to have the, the Mass said in the uh, vernacular, and the bishops' conferences are allowed to decide on how far this may go, provided Rome's support doesn't say the Holy Father explicitly has to give permission. It only says provided that uh, the, the sacred congregation for the divine worship is in agreement. Uh, that's new too. Until Vatican II, nobody was allowed to change anything in the liturgy whatsoever without explicit papal permission. And uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium suggests, makes a few suggestions, uh, like uh, they want unnecessary repetitions to be cancelled. This is why nowadays the confidior is not said before communion anymore. This is why the confidior uh, is not repeated by the people, in a, by, by the altar boys alternating with the priest, but the priest says it alone if he ever says it, because you have many options to that. Now, uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium says that the Latin language must be the language of the liturgy, and at the same time it says that parts of the Mass can be in the vernacular, and then it says if the Bishop's Conference decides so, the whole of Mass, the order of Mass, the canon can be in the vernacular. So you see it's a, a, an, a totally contradictory document. And here is uh, a very important thing that you ought to know for all the rest of what I'm going to talk about. Pius the, the six in uh, 1799 condemned the Synod of Pistoia. Now that was a, a, a thing that took place in 1786. A few bishops in the area of Pistoia in Italy came together and demanded some changes in the attitude of, the, uh, of Rome uh, towards uh, certain issues in the church. And they wanted uh, exactly what Vatican II issued. They wanted the liberty of religion. They wanted uh, a certain relaxing of the discipline, and so on. Pius VI condemned the Synod of Pistoia, condemned their pronouncements, and in his uh, bull, Octorem Fide, he says, the purpose of a council is to clarify terms, not to come up with ambiguous terms. Vatican II is ambiguous from the first to the last line. Vatican II is contradictory from the first to the last line. But I cannot go into the contradictions of Vatican II in this short talk, so I will, give, I will point out the worst heresies. And let's start with the dogmatic constitution Lumen Gentium. 
Dogmatic in this context does not mean it's dogma. It means it's a constitution on teaching. It doesn't give pastoral advice, it is teaching. Which again is a lie, because both John the 23rd and Paul the 6th said this is a pastoral council, it is not a dogmatical council. But then they came up with two dogmatic constitutions, which do not define anything, do not bind the Catholic to accept it, but are dogmatic constitutions, that means constitutions on the doctrine of the church. And Lumen Gentium is the constitution on, lit on, on the Holy Church. Lumen Gentium is in heresy. Now you have to understand that as a Catholic you're not allowed to read books that contain heresy. Because in order to, uh, in order to make a book illicit as reading for a Catholic, it is not needed that the whole book is wrong. It is to totally sufficient that part of the book is wrong. So, uh, in the old days when you had a list of books that were prohibited to Catholics, which was called the Index, there were books on the Index that contained one wrong line. There was a very good translation of the Bible on the Index, the 1S translation of the Bible into the German, German language, because it contained two or three little errors. For all the rest it was a very good translation. But because of two or three little errors, the book went on the index, didn't get the imprimatur, that means uh, the agreement of a bishop, and was prohibited to, uh, as reading to Catholics. Now Vatican II should be the first book on the index as far as this century is concerned. Because now, Lumen Gentium I. This is something you have to remember. Remember Lumen Gentium 1.8.15.16. It's easy to remember. 1, 8, 15, 16. Lumen Gentium 1 says, the church in a way is in a way the sacrament of salvation concerning all people in the world. Now first of all, the church is not a sacrament. We have the seven sacraments. The Council of Trent defined that we have seven sacraments. That's a definition, a dogmatic definition. And uh, you cannot possibly uh, make it plausible to me that Vatican II wanted to say, yes, but in a way containing all these seven sacraments, the Church is a sacrament of salvation. It is not. A sacrament and a sign. It's not. Because the Church is a perfect society. The Church has been defined as a perfect society and not a sign. A sacrament is a sign by definition. And uh, it certainly doesn't uh, concern all people because those who reject the church are not subject to the church. The church is not interested in them unless they convert. The church does not judge them. The church does not deal with them. The church is not, they do not make part of the church. But Vatican II says something different. In Lumen Gentium 8, Vatican II says the church of Christ subsists in the Catholic church. The word subsists doesn't tell you much in English. It says, it says a lot in Latin. Subsister in Latin means something that is uh, lying underneath. That means uh, uh, the grass is subsistent to my way of walking. But it could also be subsistent to Father Trinchard's way of walking. And uh, not just to mine. So when you say that the Church of Christ subsists of the Catholic Church, that does not in, in exclude the Protestant churches. Vatican II is too intelligent to, to say, they were too clever to say that the church contains the Protestant churches and the Orthodox churches and all these other churches. But they said maybe those are churches con in, contained in the Catholic Church because they said the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. For Almost 2,000 years the Catholic Church insisted that the Church of Jesus Christ is the Catholic Church. And it is defined dogma that the Church of Jesus Christ is the Catholic Church. It's identical with the Catholic Church. Nothing outside the Catholic Church is part of the Church of Christ. And nothing uh, of the Church of Christ is outside the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church and the Church of Christ are identical. The Church that Christ founded. 
Christ founded the Catholic Church and no other church. Christ did not just found the Latin rites. We have other rites in the church. I mean ways of celebrating, ways of worship. But we have only one Catholic Church. And uh, I have to repeat this now for the third time. Uh, Pope Eugene IV in 1441 at the Council of Florence defined as dogma that nobody who is not subject to the Roman Pontiff can ever be saved. He said that those who are schismatics and heretics cannot be saved, even if they for some reason believe they were shedding their blood for Christ. Now when I say they cannot be saved, when I say they cannot be saved, I mean objectively speaking they cannot be saved. There is no objective way that they could be saved. Subjectively speaking, as far as their person is concerned, we do not know if God will give them an extraordinary grace after death, if they have been honest during their lifetime here. But we do not know it. The church cannot speak about the dead. The church does not look into the hearts of people. It can't. The church has to judge according to external circumstances, to manifested formalities, to formal uh, manifestation of the faith and the formal manifestation of the faith is if you're a member of the Catholic Church and believe everything the church says and if you're subject to the Roman Pontiff and only if you are in the Catholic Church you have an objective chance of being saved this is what the dogma means now um, in uh, I will come back to that later in uh, Lumen Gentium 8 suddenly the Protestant churches make part of the Church of Christ. They do not make part of the Catholic Church, but they make part of the Church of Christ because the document says the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. Uh, excuse me, the Church it subsists to the Catholic Church. And uh, this comes to the point that Cardinal Ratzinger, abusing St. Thomas Aquinas in his quotation, being asked uh, if the, what, what that means, the Church of Christ subsists, why doesn't the Council say the Church of Christ is the Catholic Church? Cardinal Ratzinger said, Oh, but the word subsists is much stronger than the word is. And that is an academic lie. He was quoting St. Thomas, but St. Thomas talks about God himself when he says, Subsist subsistentia est nobilissima forma essendi. That means subsistence is the most noble form of being. Only in God, because God, God is not in every single flower, but he subsists to every single flower. He subsists to every single being. He subsists to everything that is in existence. Because everything that is, you, me, this house, the plants out there, this planet, the whole universe, has its being from God. Even if man created it, it receives the being from God. Those, the New Orleans streetcars are created by man, but they receive their being from God because there cannot be anything without God who is being himself. I know this is kind of difficult for you, but uh, it's so difficult because it's the most simple thing in reality. Uh, now, when the Ratzinger quotes St. Thomas Aquinas in the wrong context, and this is the method of the council, as you will see later. You quote somebody, but you quote him in the wrong place. And that's a form of lying. You cannot deny that Lumen Gentium 8 makes it optional to believe if the Catholic Church is the only true church or if there can be other churches that have a chance to get you saved. No wonder no Protestants are converting anymore. The same Lumen Gentium 8, needless to say, talks about the fact that even the churches that do not have uh, that are not in union with the Roman pontiff receive the Holy Spirit that's another heresy you can read in the Gospel of St. John that the Holy Spirit is given only to the Catholic Church at Pentecost the Holy Spirit did not come to the Lutherans to the future Lutherans at Pentecost the Holy Spirit did not come to the old religions the old pagan religions the Holy Spirit came to the Catholic Church and to nobody else it came to St. Peter, first of all, and the Apostles. So anybody who is separated from St. Peter's successor, the Pope, cannot receive the Holy Spirit. It's ridiculous. And when a Lutheran pastor baptizes an, an innocent child, 
and the innocent child dies baptized and goes to heaven, this innocent child does not go to heaven because it was baptized by a Lutheran pastor, but because a Lutheran pastor illicitly administered the Catholic sacrament of baptism. Is that clear? Now in Lumen Gentium, I do not remember at the moment, I do not have the book, and Lumen Gentium 15, something that you should look up yourself. For this I recommend from Flannery, the documents of Vatican II. Do not buy the translation of the other guy with the red cover. Buy the book with the blue book cover because the other guy translates in, a, in an accommodating way. Uh, Lumen Gentium 6, 16 is something that you can entirely judge on your own. The Muslims, together with us, adore one merciful God. Together with us. That's a quotation. Musulmani nubiscum adorant unum deum misericordiosum in Latin. I checked it in Latin to make sure that this heresy stands firm. It stands firm. Now where's the incarnation? Where's the Trinity? The Quran, the holy book of the Muslims, calls, I'm quoting the Quran, calls the idea of a holy trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, an excremental idea. I'm quoting the Quran, beg your pardon. And now Vatican II tells me that they, together with us, adore one merciful God. Now where's the first commandment? They have another God, they have Allah. The lonely one person, Allah. We have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the second person of God, the Son, become man. And the Word became flesh. Ad verbum caro factum est, at the last Gospel at Mass. Uh, I've never heard about Allah, that he would have become verbum. That, that, that the Allah would have become caro, the meat, the flesh. I've never heard that Allah assumed uh, uh, a human nature. And if you tell a Muslim that Allah uh, was incarnated on earth, he will kill you. And he is right from his viewpoint of religion. The Muslims are not as accommodating as the Catholics. And uh, God will probably bless many of them for, for, for merely that reason. Now the Vatican too tries to tell me that I pray together with the Muslims to the one merciful God. This is blasphemy. It is heresy and it is blasphemy. And the same Lumen Gentium 16 tells me that the Jews and I pray to the same God. The Jews explicitly reject the Incarnation. The Jews explicitly rejected the idea of the Blessed Trinity. And they call it names, believe me, in their books. And how? Not even I would quote that. And now Vatican II tells me we are all praying to the same God. Do you realize that a certain German author, Gotthold Elf Ephraim Lessing, in the 18th century, wrote a, a, a play called The Ring Parable, the, Paral the Parable of the Ring, in which he has a representative of the Catholic Church, a representative of uh, the Muslims, and a representative of the Jewish faith, agreeing with each other that everything is the same anyway, because we pray to the same God. Gotthold Ephraim Lessing was a practicing and open Freemason. And here we have Vatican II, a so-called ecumenical council, repeating what Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, the admittedly open Freemason, said in his play. The idea, the concept, that the Muslims and the Jews pray into the same God as we do, which our present Pope repeats over and over again. This concept is heresy. It implies a lot of other heresies, and it is blasphemy. And anybody who tells me that we can interpret this in a Catholic way is to say the least a little bit not. I quote again, the Muslims together with us adore one merciful God. Now give me a Catholic interpretation of that. I don't think that even CNN could come up with an, a, a Catholic interpretation on that. And they are very good in making up excuses, lines and other things. Whoops, I hope nobody will sue me. And um, this is uh, Lumen Gentium. There's other things in Lumen Gentium that cry out to heaven for being blasphemous, stupid and heretical. But we have to go on.
The next document concerned is Dignitatis Humanae, and I quoted it already in one of my former speeches, but now I have to quote it in the context again. Dignitatis Humanae number three says, and to make it easier for you to understand what I'm saying, I will quote the present Pope's interpretation of this line, quoted from Catechesi Tradenda number 32, Quarum ope Spiritus Christi non apnuit salutem affere, for the efforts of which the Spirit of Christ does not deny to bring salvation. Whom does he talk about? He talks about the Protestant churches, the Pope does. That means, he says, for the, to the efforts of the Protestant churches, the Spirit of Christ does not deny salvation. Now get this. Is there anybody here who does not understand the distinction between subjective and objective? I presume so. Objective means you are concerned with the, the matter, the thing. Subjective means you are concerned with the person. That means with his conscience, with his intentions, with his view of things. The wine I'm drinking here is objectively an excellent wine. Subjectively you might not like it all the same. Uh, some other soft drinks around here are objectively absolutely bad, but uh, you might like them subjectively. You understand? Now, uh, Vatican II and the present Pope talk about the Protestant churches, and they talk about the efforts of the Protestant churches. Now, if you tell me that it would be possible that a Protestant who has lived a just life all of his life who has tried his best to find out the truth, who has tried his best to avoid sin, will not be sent to hell by God, I will say, I don't know, maybe. Through an extraordinary act of grace from God, or an act of, 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 of authentic contrition, he might actually die as a member of the Catholic Church without knowing but wanting to do so. That's possible. It is in a certain way possible Unfortunately, today, this possibility is exhausted into the impossible by all the modern priests and bishops. In reality, this is very highly improbable, if ever possible. However, we cannot exclude it, subjectively speaking. Objectively speaking, if anybody says that the efforts of the Protestant Church, and remember what I said about the innocent child being baptized in a stolen sacrament, anybody who says that the efforts of Protestant churches can save a soul is a heretic. Dignitatis Humane of Vatican II and the present Pope says it. So the present Pope is a heretic. We have discussed the question if that makes him seize the Pope or not. It doesn't. He's still the Pope. He's a bad Pope. He's a heretical Pope, an ignorant Pope, and a Pope who lies. But that doesn't make him cease to be Pope, just like the Archbishop of New Orleans is not exactly what you call a Catholic Bishop, but he is the Bishop of New Orleans. And President Clinton is the Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces in this country, even though he's a draft dodger. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, excuse me, I was talking about uh, uh, President Clinton. Her husband is a draft dodger. Um, <laughs> Uh, now, uh, the efforts of the Protestant churches cannot save anybody. They cannot save anything. The efforts of the Protestant churches can only bring you down to hell. Because the efforts of the Protestant churches are heretical efforts, objectively speaking. I do not condemn the poor pastor. And in this regard, I should mention to you that in St. Thomas Church in New York, Episcopalian, I found the best sermon on the devil in a long time not in St. Patrick's. However, Christ was never substantially present in the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful St. Thomas Church in 52nd Street, 5th Avenue, New York. And except for baptism, there was no sacrament given there ever. You do not receive uh, confirmation in St. Thomas. You cannot go to confession in St. Thomas. You cannot save your soul in St. Thomas Church, not objectively speaking. You understand when I say not objectively speaking? This is very important. So, Dignitatis Humane, number three, is heretical. So the whole document is heretical. So the whole council is heretical. The next thing, in De Verbum. De Verbum is the document, and it's called a, a dogmatic constitution. De Verbum is the document on the interpretation of Holy Scripture. And there, 
with the impertinence of quoting De Filius of First Vatican II, they redefine the term of tradition. Now Vatican I, did I say Vatican II or Vatican I? Vatican II has the gall to uh, quote Vatican I on its own reinterpretation of tradition. The first Vatican Council last century under Pius IX, the first Vatican Council defined dogma, defined tradition as everything that has been handed down to us, including the uh, written tradition, that means Holy Scripture, and oral tradition, and that means everything the apostles heard to come out of the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Period. That's tradition. Some things in oral tradition we do not yet fully know. That's not a development of tradition. Tradition is there. Like uh, the apostles knew that Our Lady was immaculately conceived. It became a dogma only in 1854. The apostles knew that Our Lady was assumed into heaven with her body. It became a dogma only in 1950. That's not a development of tradition. This is just finding tradition which is there and defining tradition which is there. So I repeat, Vatican I, the first Vatican Council, which was a true council, the first Vatican Council said there's two sources of the faith, Holy Scripture and tradition. And tradition, the oral tradition, is exactly what I was talking about. Everything received from the words of our Lord Jesus, or from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now, Vatican II says there is a growth in tradition. That means tradition is developed under the influence of the faithful's study and their religious experiences. Get this. Now suddenly we do not need Holy Scripture anymore. Suddenly we do not need the popes anymore who interpret Holy Scripture and what has been handed down to us from one pope to the other. Suddenly we have the faithful involved with their religious experiences and with their own studies. You cannot possibly imagine how much I give on the people's studies and their religious experiences, even if they are clergy and especially when they are clergy. So this is the new de definition of tradition. By the way, parenthesis, the famous document De Verbum of 1988 in which the Pope uh, uh, fakes to uh, uh, want uh, the old mass to be said. The Pope is a liar because a year after that he said he doesn't, li he doesn't like the fact that so many people are still, uh, still, still attached to those forms of worship. He meant the old mass. He said that a year after he issued Ecclesia Dei telling the bishops that they should give wide and generous permission for the old mass. That goes to show you the honesty of the man. Uh, in Ecclesia Dei, he criticizes Archbishop Lefebvre for his view on tradition. Now, Archbishop Lefebvre, I read everything he ever wrote. Archbishop Lefebvre was a very unoriginal man as far as doctrine is concerned. I have never heard anything out of the mouth of Archbishop Lefebvre that would be in any way new to me. Unless I hadn't studied well my theology before that. Archbishop Lefebvre, as far as his theological pronouncements are concerned, was entirely unoriginal. Because he was totally and completely faithful to the doctrine of the church. With absolutely no exception whatsoever. And he quoted the First Vatican Council and said, tradition is what the apostles heard coming from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ and had, which has been handed down to us by the popes. And then uh, the present pope accuses Archbishop Lefebvre of a wrong understanding of tradition quoting De Verbum number 8. We have to say more about that. The experience of the faithful and their personal studies are adding to the growth of tradition. Thanks, but no thanks. 
Next. The entire document, Gaudium et Spes, that's the document on the church in the modern world, was written by the found, was written in a sense, not directly but indirectly, written by the founder of the Opus Dei, the so-called, because he isn't, the so-called Blessed Jose Maria Escrivá de Balaguer, who wanted the church to be a society based on the laity, a concept that has been condemned by Pius X in his encyclical on modernism. He wanted the church to conform to the modern world, and he wanted a one-world government. Gaudium et Spes, in number 12, utters blasphemy when it says, all the religions of this world, the non-Christian and the Christian religion, agree with us that all religious efforts and all the efforts of the church are directed towards man. That's a literal quotation. Directed towards man. Sounds familiar to the one who has read about the Masons. Sounds familiar to the one who has read about blasphemies uttered at the United Nations or at the Presidio. Doesn't it? Now to say that all the efforts of the church are directed towards man is heresy and blasphemy. All the efforts of the church are directed towards God in reality. Now the old mass says so. The new mass uh, not sure. Gaudium et Space also postulates, as I said before, a peaceful government of the whole world under one body of government. Mm. This is to say the least naive in 1965, when most of the governments on this, in this world were already anti-clerical and against the church. It is, to, to, to say the least, naive. I do not believe for a moment that it is naive. I believe it's diabolical. And I do recommend to you to buy this book on Vatican II. And if you write to me, I will give you all the numbers concerned. It doesn't cost me much time. It's some 40 numbers, something like that, all through the council. You read those numbers, then you know exactly why the conciliar church is not the Catholic church, but the counterfeit church. You just read Vatican II on which they are based. Another thing about Vatican II, I, uh, there is no need to quote uh, the wonderful uh, document on religious liberty. Please do not call it religious freedom. In this country the words freedom and liberty are usually confused, not only by the Democrats as usual, but also by the Republicans, unfortunately. Freedom is a good thing. Liberty is a bad thing. Freedom means you have the freedom to do what you have to do. Liberty means you are at liberty to do what you want. And that's not liberty, but slavery of sin. St. Paul says that, not I. So as long as the Statue of Liberty is not the Statue of Freedom, I'm not interested in the old broad in New York Harbor. Uh, we talk about the liberty of religion. And the liberty of religion is something in Vatican II that caused many bishops to stop signing documents. Because Vatican II, in, uh, I always forget the name of the document. There are such crazy names and titles. What's the one on religious liberty? Um, um, I can't remember it right now, I'm sorry. I should have brought the book, but uh, you can find it easily. If the one who has the book, just check uh, in the index under religious freedom or, or freedom of religion or liberty of religion, whatever they call it. Liberty of religion has been condemned by the popes, Gregory the 16th, Pius the 9th, Leo the 13th, Pius the 10th, Pius the 11th, Pius the 12th. You are not free to choose your religion. You are bound in conscience to choose the Catholic Church and to belong to the Catholic Church. And if you don't, you will go to hell. Okay? Or as the Church says it, objectively speaking, you cannot be saved. The Church cannot condemn anybody into hell, not even uh, Judas Iscariot. There's no pronouncement on him, ever. So, 
anybody who thinks that he's free to choose the religion might go to hell for it. See, if I was free to choose my religion in this country, I would join with the Episcopalians. They have nicer churches, but they have a better salary. I could marry. I could still say, uh, uh, even if in English, a beautiful form of Mass in St. Thomas Church. And it's not Mass, but, but, but who cares? Uh, in St. Thomas Church, they say the evening service with the, the veil over the chalice and the burrs and the missile is on the epistle side and the altar is facing God. And what an altar! Whoo! Beautiful. One of the most beautiful neo-Gothic altars I've ever seen. And the priest is nicely dressed. And when he gives a sermon, he gives a sermon that reminds you of your duties towards God, of your uh, duty to avoid sin. He talks about you must save your soul. He talks about the glory of the Blessed Trinity. He doesn't talk about Nicaragua. He doesn't talk about the economically disadvantaged. He doesn't talk about the poor people in prison. He doesn't talk about all of that and that and that. He talks about God and our, our duty to save our souls. If I had the freedom of religion, I'd been an Episcopalian for many years already. But I do not have it. I am bound in conscience to adore God in the way that God wants me to adore Him. And that means I have to be a Catholic even if it costs me my life. There is no such thing as liberty of religion. Forget it. Forget Vatican II. Let's print the bumper sticker. Forget Vatican II. <laughs> Now, one last short comment on our dear present Pope. I'm going to quote only one encyclical, and you will be astonished. His first encyclical. It's an old tradition, the Pope's first encyclical is the most important encyclical, because in the first encyclical, the Pope says what is going to be his program for his pontificate. His first encyclical is called Redemptor Hominis. The Redeemer of man. Mind you, not the Redeemer of men, plural, but the Redeemer of M-A-N, of man. Undefined. Everybody, therefore. In this document, apart from the fact that the document is truckloads of you know what, uh, in his document, he never ever uses the term Roman Catholic or Catholic Church. He speaks about the conscience of the church, that sounds like one of those TV preachers, right? The conscience of the church. He talks about the church of the, the, of the New Advent. I don't know what the New Advent is. Probably referring to his constant uh, references to the year 2000. Well, he will find out to the different. I know that the year 2000 is not going to make a change to anybody, just because it's a two with three zeros. Uh, who cares? And uh, in his document, number 10, second line, he utters the following statement. The amazement about the value and dignity of man is called the good news the gospel. It is also called Christianism. I repeat, the amazement about the value and the dignity of the human being or man is called the good news or the gospel. It is also called Christianism. Vocatur item Christianismus. In the German translation of this encyclical that I have, the translator was so ashamed of this that he left out the word, it is also called Christianism. He just left it out in the German translation. Vocatur enim Christianismus. He just left it out. And I checked the, I don't remember, I haven't memorized it, but I checked the, the Latin original, and you always have to interpret church documents according to the Latin original, not the Polish original, okay? Uh, because the Latin original will be used by future popes, not the Polish original, because future pope hopefully will not be able to speak Polish. And uh, so the, uh, uh, the, the, the Latin original is correctly translated the way I do. So I repeat this astonishing line. The amazement about the value and the dignity of man is called the, uh, the, the good news, the gospel is also called Christianism. That's blasphemy. That's absolute and total blasphemy. 
St. Pius X said, the only dignity of man is in his being a Catholic. That's the only dignity in him. The only dignity of man that I have is in my being a Catholic and a Catholic priest, not in my being Gregory Hesse. It's in my being... And in the same encyclical, and with this I conclude because I'm sick and tired of it, in this same encyclical, the Pope says, with the incarnation of Christ, man has been revealed to himself. He's only quoting Gaudium at space number 22. Man has been revealed to himself until this Pope taught me uh, to forget my old faith. I had, I had always believed that the New Testament was who had revealed the Son and the Holy Spirit to us. I always thought that the, 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 the message of the New Testament was revealing the Son, the Incarnation, and the Holy Spirit. And this Pope tells me man has been revealed to himself. I think he was in India for too long. That's why people went in the 60s to find themselves. Yes. Yeah. So what we have here, all together, is not only a new church, it is a Gnostic sect. Look up in the dictionary the word G-N-O-S-T-I-C. Look it up in the dictionary. Gnostic, Gnostic. It comes from Gnosis, Erkenntnis, no, Enlightenment. The word, uh, there, is no, there is no good translation in English for the word Gnosis. There is only one in, in, not even Italian, Erkenntnis in German. Sometimes in psychology, modern psychology, even in the English language, the word erkenntnis is used for that reason, because there is no proper term in English. It's uh, the fact that you realize something, but there's no word for the realization, but that's, I don't think that's good English. So that's Gnosis. Now, a, a Gnostic sect, I don't have to explain to you what a sect is. You know about the Jehovah Witnesses. I like them much more than the, the, the new church, because the Jehovah Witnesses at least try to mission. To, to convert other people, which personally, subjectively speaking, is a nice effort. Now, uh, in, modern, in the modern church, they will tell you uh, uh, to join another religion uh, instead. So, a uh, agnostic sect is a sect that believes that man is the superior being, and only uh, the recognition of things in our brain is what counts. Which means you have a purely subjective religion, which means you make your own religion, and which means you can do whatever you want, it'll be fine. That'd be nice. As Gilbert Keith Chesterton said, if I was not a Catholic, I would have a harem. <laughs> Believe me, I would. <laughs> so, uh, you, can, you see how absurd, you see the absurdity of things. We are living in a Gnostic sect founded by Vatican II, which our dear beloved present Pope calls the Second Pentecost. And I cannot say amen to that. I disagree with him, he's a heretic, I reject his teachings, I do not reject his papacy, I reject what he does in his papacy, and I reject what he says, period. Questions and answers. I think that question is on yesterday's tape, so I, I can answer briefly now. Uh, you must not go to the new mass, because the new mass is against the will of the church, against the will of God, it's against divine law. It is an illegal right, illicit. It's not only against divine law, it's against eternal law, too. Eternal law is first, then divine law, as, an, as his own interpretation of his own eternal law, and then uh, positive law, natural law, and then positive law. It's against, it's against positive law, pronounced by Pius V, it's against the uh, natural law uh, as the tradition of the church, and it's against divine law as the dogma of the Council of Trent, and it's against eternal law, therefore. You cannot attend the Novus Ordo Mass unless you have to for social purposes, 
uh, like you did, and in this case you do not say amen because amen does not mean all right, it's okay. Amen means yes, yes, yes. You can't say yes to the new mass. The new mass does not represent the Catholic faith. But uh, yesterday's conference, uh, I can I can give you more information on that later on. But now as the camera is running. Humanly speaking, zilch, zero, rien, nada, nix, nichts, gar nichts, ничего, niente. Thank you. Humanly speaking, I, 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 God has to work a miracle, but I mean, I don't know if God will, want, will, will work a miracle. He might end the world. I don't know. I don't know. I ain't no prophet. I'm not judging people who do not know. You, you cannot commit a sin if you don't know. Sometimes ignorance is a sin, but not the thing you do because of ignorance. You what? I call it the nervous disorder. Very good, yeah. You should call it the nervous disorder. <laughs> It's a absolutely yeah yeah well it's a disorder but we talked about that yesterday uh, is uh, everything I told you about Vatican II so crystal clear that there are no questions I doubt that don't be afraid of asking a stupid question only the one who laughs about a stupid question is stupid well um, I know that several cardinals were masons. Uh, I don't know about living cardinals. I have no information on that. I, I doubt there is no car there, I doubt there is no mason among the cardinals, but I don't know how many. Uh, I know several cardinals were masons. There's no sense in naming names here. Most of them you won't know anyway. And uh, I know that the masons have uh, tried already in the last century to infiltrate the church, and they succeeded because Pope Leo XIII, Secretary of State, was a mason. But this I have said in my first conference. You will have it on tape. And uh, as far as the infiltration of the church is concerned, I can give you an information which I did not mention, I forgot, uh, the day before yesterday. In, nine, in the 1930s, Stalin started already to insert KGB agents into Western seminaries. And in 1974, NATO, in its annual report, not the report you could buy at the newspaper stand, but uh, the report that fortunately I got to see, uh, estimated uh, uh, 3,000 KGB agents to be found among the Catholic hierarchy, that means priests and bishops. 3,000 KGB agents. NATO in 1974. Don't kill me if it was 76, but I think it was 74. Of course there are KGB agents in the Vatican. You think the KGB is stupid? The KGB is not the CIA, Christians in action. That's the field term for them. And uh, the infiltration it must be deep down. 